Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Soul Focused Radio. This is your host, Martin Friedman, and I am so excited today to introduce you to a new voice here at the Soul Focus Group. Uh, I want to introduce everybody to Tirza. Tirza, say hi. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hello, wherever you are in this universe. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me, Martin. I'm I'm really excited for you to be here, Tirza. So I want to just first let me just ask you how are you doing? Like how are things going? I know you're coming to us from Queens in New York City, and you know how's everything going there today? Today is a beautiful day. The sun is shining. I have been blessed with a new day. My children are well. I do work that I love. I'm focused on what I'm called to do. And I have exciting projects I'm working on this week. So I'm feeling good, Martin. You know, I focus on keeping the vibrations high. Nice, nice, nice. I'm really glad to hear that. And like I said, I'm I'm really excited to talk to you um, today. You know, you and I have been... Uh, spending a lot of virtual time together, planning for a workshop we're doing together and, you know, working together with Soul Focus Group and, you know, virtually getting to know each other, you know, through this this COVID time. So I've been really excited to get you on this podcast and to introduce you to our listeners and, you know, to be able to talk about the unique perspective that you bring to the Soul Focus Group. So why don't you just say a little bit about who you are, you know, where you come from, a little bit of your backstory. Just tell us who is Tirza. Yeah. So who am I? Well, let's, when we speak about the who, it's about who I am authentically. You know, I am a child of God. I am blessed. I am favored. I am in love with life. I am constantly growing and ever evolving being who is just, just digging into what this life has for me. That's the who, you know, constantly Mm -hmm. showing up as my true self, practicing the showing up as my true self in terms of what, what I do. And in terms of my career and my career journey, I am a motivational speaker. I am a professional development trainer where I have an opportunity to train employees in different organizations. And I'm also a life strategist coach. So I have an opportunity to work with individuals one-on-one for them to just evolve into their true selves and to find their freedom. So I'm in a space of just being able to pour into folks and continuously pouring into myself so I can be of service to others. I'm also a mom. I have two beautiful children, an 11-year-old named Cassia and Iman, who is seven. And so um, I'm juggling all of it. <laughs> and it's a fun journey. It's a fun journey. So Tirza, you were, you said something about, I think a life strategist coach. Yes. Is that what you said? Yeah. To talk a little bit about what does that mean? What does that look like for you? And what does that look like for somebody working with you to be a life strategist? Sure. So in working with individuals, it's working with them to develop strategy for their mm-hmm. life. When an individual comes to me, they are seeking something, they are looking for something, they are desiring to make a shift in their lives, and they're often asking, how do I do that? How do I change something in my life? How do I become what I'm supposed to be, what I'm destined to be? Um, How do I heal? And so in the work that I do, it's about strategy. It's no different if you were in the workplace and you had a project and you were developing strategy for it. Well, life is about a strategy. It's tapping into ideas. It's tapping into your resources. It's practicing what you know and applying it to your life. And so the work that I do is very spirit led. It's listening to hear what my coaching clients aren't saying and supporting them in developing a strategy that is true to them, that is realistic, that is practical, but it gets them results quickly. Mm, Nice, nice. And so talk a little bit about how you came to be with the Soul Focus Group. So everybody listening is at least somewhat familiar with who we are and what we do. And, you know, we talk a lot about integration of spiritual consciousness and social consciousness. And tell us, uh, tell us how you got to be involved in Soul Focus Group. Sure. Long story short, I met our CEO, Mandy Davenport, many, many, many years ago 
and we reconnected just about a year ago. During the, in the height of COVID, in the height of COVID, we reconnected virtually. And after learning about what he and the team was doing, I was intrigued by it. I was excited by it. And he invited me to be a part of the facilitation team. And Mm -hmm. I said, sure, why not? I am a trainer, a professional development trainer, as I mentioned. So I'm, 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 experience with, you know, speaking in front of audiences. But however, the content was slightly different from what I'm used to. You know, mm-hmm. being that the so focus group work is very much focused on the social consciousness and the social justice, it was a learning curve for me and it still is, but I've been enjoying it. I've been embracing it. I'm proud of how I've grown through the support of you and Dustin and my D and the rest of the team members. And so now here I am. Not only do I act as a facilitator, I also provide consulting. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad to just be a part of the team. This is a really rich, deep, strong family, and I'm happy to be a member of it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And, and, you know, we're so excited to have you as a part of what we're doing, too, because I think, you you know, you bring that that strategy mindset. It was really interesting for me to hear you describe yourself that way because I think that strategic mindset is is really important for us. Um, I know it is for me because sometimes I won't say you know I don't think we ever get lost in the esotericness if that's a word or esotericism. And I also know that you know when I think of esoteric, I'm really thinking of that spiritual consciousness and social consciousness integration. That, you know, I think our, you know, the folks that are attracted to us, I think are still getting used to that integration, right? And because, you know, as you well know, you know, the reason why Soul Focus Group was started is because of a lack of spiritual consciousness in the social consciousness world and a lack of social consciousness in the spiritual consciousness world, right? So it's this integration, it's the marrying of the two that is unique. And I'm wondering, like, how do you see, you know, a strategic approach being aligned with the integration of spiritual and social consciousness? How is that kind of influencing what you do and how you even see and define what strategy is? Mm, Great question, Martin. Thank you. You know, it Mm. is about strategy and strategy always begins with introspection. Where are you? Where is an individual? Where is an organization? as it relates to the social consciousness or the spiritual consciousness, right? The self-awareness is critical to developing a solid plan that can work. And so even when I think about the work of the Soul Focus Group, we are continuously inviting the people that we train to do deep introspection. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, you grow and emerge with education. We must continuously Mm -hmm. be educated about what we think we know and be open to what we don't know. So even In my work as a coach, it is bringing awareness through the process of education, new knowledge, new ways of thinking. And in that way, we evolve to a consciousness. But you can't skip one part of that three part strategy. Right. That introspection is critical. The eagerness to grow and to become educated about what you're learning about yourself, what you don't know about yourself, what you don't know about the world is so important to arrive at a space of consciousness, whether it's social or spiritual. That's a solid strategy. Constantly looking at yourself is really where it begins. And that's challenging for us all. It's challenging because we're forced to look at the man in the mirror, right? And so it's easy to look outside of ourselves, but the greatest work and yet the most challenging work is to look within. But once we see that within is not well in certain areas, It's time to educate ourselves on how we become well, practice what we're learning so that we can evolve and emerge into our highest self. Hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that, Tirza, because, you know, I was in the I was in the nonprofit world, the you know, the city government world and all the different worlds that come along with that. And even as I started to train and um, do technical assistance around race and racism, I started, you know, being in pretty much all these worlds and more recently, you know, more exposed to like the corporate world. And so I kind of get this funny feeling when I hear strategic, right? Cause like I, I know with nonprofits, for example, you know, they would come to the, when I was doing the undoing racism trainings with the people's Institute, they'd come to a training, you know, they would get excited by it and they would, you know, they would leave. And then the first thing they do is they go on a retreat 
And after retreat, they would say, all right, we need to put rate, you know, anti-racism into our language, into our mission statement and all that stuff. And then the, the second day of the retreat, they would start a process of a three year strategic plan to integrate anti-racism into everything that they did. Now, I say that and I've, I've, you know, I've said this at a lot of trainings, almost those exact words. And I say it to people because I have never seen long term transformational change around institutional, systemic and structural uh, racism using that strategic initiative approach. So what I'm hearing you saying is that maybe we've been using the wrong strategy or that even just how we've defined strategy hasn't been proper as we go through this sort of ritual of creating these strategic plans. And we do one almost every three years and they mirror each other with just a little bit of different language. I'm wondering if you found the same thing and what are your thoughts about really a redefinition of, of what a strategic plan looks like? Mm-hmm. Interesting question. I'm sure organizations have good intent. They want to do something. They know they must do something because they have to answer the call to do something. Now, if there's a rush in the process because they feel they must answer the call, the strategy is going to move in the wrong direction. The intent is very important, right? We speak about intent versus impact. If the intention is not pure, if it's not natural, if it's not focused on long-term efforts, if it's not aligned with true commitment, In addition to engaging every level of employee within the organization, then it's not a real strategy. So I'm being called to this idea of what is the intent when we say we're going to sit down and develop strategy. You and I are currently working on a project where, you know, we've seen uh, this particular organization seem to be moving fast to get to something but not necessarily want to lean in to what the real issue is because something has to be done now. And though the intent to them (laughs) may be Mm -hmm. positive, what will be the long-term impact, right? And so if the intent is not right, if the intent is not aligned with really making true transformational change, then it's not a good strategy. Mm Mm-hmm. So part of the strategy is making sure that intent and impact match up and that they, there's often a huge gap there, like you're saying. Right. And I, I could imagine that in one on one coaching clients, you find that, too. Like, you know, I mean, it's 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 the New Year's. Right. How many people have the intent right now to lose weight, to exercise more, to start this or stop that? Right. How many people right now are are showing this intent and then what will be the gap between the intent and the impact for us as individuals. And we see the same thing happen in organizations, right? I wonder, you know, using the experience that you have in terms of the one-on-one coaching, what do you often see as the, as that gap between the intent and impact? Commitment is a big gap between intent and impact. Mm, When we're speaking about coaching, It's the commitment to self that is often lacked or the individual is lacking the commitment to themselves. I often have clients come to me focused on what's happening around them, who's doing it to them and all the reasons why it's happening to them. Hmm. But what they're missing, most importantly, is themselves, looking at themselves and doing the work within the commitment to self, the commitment to doing the introspection and educating themselves so that they can have more self-consciousness. So that intent versus impact or the gap is about how committed are you to yourself? Mm -hmm. How committed are you to closing your eyes to everything around you and looking within to arrive at that place where you're really seeing the impact on your life that you most desire. Mm -hmm. Commitment to self is the biggest gap. When we zone in and focus on ourselves and commit to doing the work, everything lines up. Healing Mm -hmm. begins. Transformation begins. Appreciation of self begins. Love of self begins. And Mm -hmm. then 
in turn, we begin to attract those things that we most desire. But this society is so used to focusing on what's happening outside of us because it's easier Mm -hmm. to do. It's easier to blame our mom, to blame the Mm -hmm. system, to blame dad or a sibling or a husband or a wife. It's so much easier to do that than to actually look at yourself and say, where do I need to do the work within? When we lean into that work within, we start to see the impact we desire most in our lives. Mm. Yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying right now. And you're really making me think about what we talk about at the Soul Focus Group all the time, which is ego, right? Because it feels like ego is that thing that keeps us from maintaining our commitment to ourselves in terms of that individual coaching process that you talk about, you know, that it's ego that stops us from, you know, exercising twice a day, like we say we're going to do on January 1st. It's ego that convinces us we should, you know, have that second helping of whatever, right? And it's it's so it's questioning ourselves. It's ego questions us. Ego asks us to look through, you know, another person's lens. And one of the things I'm thinking about as you're talking, I really want to run this by you because I know you're really, you know, you really immersed yourself with understanding the ego and how the ego plays out in all the different work that you do, both, you know, in your own consulting and coaching and now with Soul Focus Group. But I'm wondering how ego even plays into that original intent. So like, let's just take, let's take a New Year's resolution, for example. Um, What I'm thinking of right now is that even like the resolution to lose weight, is that coming from a place that is really about our true selves? Or is it coming from a place about how will people view us externally? Are we meeting an external standard? And I'm wondering what you think about that and how you see that playing out both in individual coaching and also in the uh, collective work that you're doing now. Let me first explain to you how I see the ego and how I define it. And it's a, cool. it's a constant growth process for me to understanding the ego because the ego is very complicated. It's very complicated. So the ego to me is that person, that person that is designed to get in your way and make you have conflict with yourself. Mm -hmm. It is designed for you to question, doubt, uh, and stay unconscious to who you really are, Mm -hmm. to your true self. It is designed to block you from rising to your highest being tapping into your purest inner being. Mm. And so when we think about the question of when you are making a resolution to work out, well, beautiful, you should, Mm -hmm. you should adore Mm -hmm. yourself, love yourself and want to be your best self. Mm -hmm. But if the intention is for people to look at you or see you a certain way and you make that more of a priority than you just being you and finding the reason to work out because you just want to be healthy and be fulfilled for yourself, the ego is playing a part in that decision. And if the ego is playing a part in that decision, what do you think the impact will be? Now, this is interesting because if you are driven by what other people think about you and how they see you and you get the feedback you want from those people, Mm -hmm. the impact in terms of how you feel about yourself is going to be good because you're driven by how uh, other people see you. But freedom is, I'm not driven by how other people see me. Right. I'm driven by the space of freedom and living for what is good for me. I'm living in the space of seeking wholeness within self and I'm not blinded by what other people are seeing of me. And so mm-hmm. the impact will be so much more rewarding, so much more fulfilling because it's aligned to a pure intention that's connected to your true self. So yes, to your question, Martin, if 
You are focused on what other people think of you. You are living life for what other pe people think of you. You are uh, making every effort to keep up with the Joneses. That is the ego in full force mm -hmm. positioning you to be in conflict with yourself. Because mm -hmm. if you do not get what you want from others, what happens? If you don't get the rewards, the recognition, the acknowledgement from others, what happens to you then? Mm -hmm. Do you fall apart? Do you see yourself as less than? Do you beat yourself up saying I'm not enough? Typically, that's what happens. Whenever we're dependent on other people to give us credibility, to define our value and our worth, it is a setup for failure. Mm -hmm. And that's all because the ego is driving the intent. Right. If it's an ego driven intent, we're not going to be able to sustain it. And it's going to end up having a different impact internally and externally because that's unsustainable. The, the whole point, right, is like you say, that the design is a design of failure. Like our ego is designed to make us fail at reconnecting with our true and authentic selves because we are most powerful and therefore most threatening to like, I guess you'd say the people in charge. I'm not sure how you view this, but I know for me, you know, I've come to understand that, you know, you said something that was just brilliant and powerful. I believe you said something like working towards the space of freedom. Is that what you said? I love that. I love the phrasing of that, right? Like that is a, that is a beautiful thought, both internally and externally that we are working towards the space of freedom. I was negligent today and not wishing you a a good uh, or happy, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the right the right salutation, but that today is uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s day today. And that feels like something he would say. <laughs> that feels like something in his spirit, you know, that we're working towards the space of freedom, that it's not just an external social justice place, but we're also working towards that space of freedom. What does that space of freedom look like for you, like internally and externally? What does it look like? You know, how would you describe it to somebody if they were saying, like, you know, how do I get there? So let me first explain what I mean by that and why I yeah. say that. So yeah. I believe the greatest vision we can have for our life is freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom provides us everything we desire. And when I speak about freedom, I'm speaking about inner freedom. And so if, let's bring it back to the example of working out to uh, look good for someone else, to, mm -hmm. to be acknowledged for someone else. Freedom is not thinking about someone else. It's doing what's best for you and what serves you in its purest and true, truest design. Not being divided, right? So when I define ego, it's a person that is designed to put you in conflict with yourself. Freedom is saying you don't have to be in conflict with yourself. You don't have to think about what other people are thinking about you because you are connected to your truest you. That's freedom. Mm -hmm. And being connected to your truest you allows you to flow, allows you to be able to listen to your inner being speak and guide you void of pressure void of the opinions of others, void of your history, your pain, anything that you've gone through that may have been an injustice to you, is saying, I'm free from that. I'm focusing on now and I'm trusting. I'm trusting what I call the realms of freedom, the six truths based on the realms of freedom. Life is for you and not against you. Everything is working for your good. God is only good and it's always working in your favor. Now, let me speak about that just a bit. I am a Christian and I grew up and raised in the church. And what I've become, what I've come to see in my new lens of freedom is that I did not see God. In all its, his, her, universe, goodness. Mm -hmm. I saw God with limitations because I never lined up to the expectation of God. Mm -hmm. 
And when you have that thinking, how could you fully embrace all the good that God has for us? So one of the realms of freedom is God is only good and it's only working in your favor. Realizing that and not attaching sin, past choices to that has given me a freedom that feels so damn good. Mm. So damn good. Again, I'm talking about the six truths that are connected to the realms of freedom. Another one that has helped me evolve and have seen really connect with my coaching clients is this truth about honoring yourself as the greatest priority. Mm -hmm. So going back to the example of working out, you know, that's a new year's resolution. The choice to do that has to align with you honoring yourself. When you are choosing to do it for others, and you feel in conflict when you know you're doing it for others, you're not honoring your truest self. Mm -hmm. So honoring self is one of the greatest priorities we can have. And again, honoring self requires you to look yourself in the mirror and face the truth and live up to it and honor that. Another realm of freedom is that it's possible to have anything that we desire, anything that we desire. That piece of truth it took time for me to get there because my experiences, my socialization said that, well, I came from a certain place. I didn't come from wealth. I, I grew up in a, neighbor, a neighborhood that was categorized as poor. Mm -hmm. I worked for a nonprofit for all my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. How can I have anything that I desire? And so it's a shift in perspective and a shift in mindset. That mm -hmm. no matter where I came from, no matter what's happening in this world now, i.e. COVID, I can really have anything that I can I desire. And I say that sitting here, experiencing that in this very moment. And it's mind blowing to me that I have everything that I desire. And that doesn't mean my life is perfect. But everything that I've asked for, I am seeing it come to life every day. I'm living it. I'm experiencing it. And it keeps unfolding for me. It required me to line up to that truth, though, for me to really be able to tap into it. And the final one is that we are a creator of our destiny. So if it's possible for me to have everything that I desire, if it's true that God is good and he's always working in my favor, if it's true that everything is working for my good and life is not against me, but for me, then it is possible for me to create whatever I desire and whatever I want for my destiny. But I got to get, we all got to get, and I say God, I know that's not the right term, right? We all have to get lined up with these truths and embrace or shift our perspective that it all is working out for us, period. Mm -hmm. And so as I grow into these truths and as I teach them to my coaching clients and, and when I have my webinar events, I'm seeing the breakthrough in my life, but I'm also seeing the breakthrough in others, which tells me this is the path. But again, we have to shift our perspective. We need to put on a new pair of glasses and look through a different lens because the lens that we have been looking through is so foggy based on socialization, constructs, programs, paradigms, and patterns. What our mama said, what our daddy said, and that has driven our actions in the way we think. And so Another piece of freedom is you have permission to challenge anything that you grew up with that no longer serves you to question it, challenge it and change it so that you can line up with the six truths I just spoke about. Hmm. Beautiful. Wow. That was that was awesome. I feel like uh, you just took us to school a little bit or, or maybe to church or. You know, for me, maybe you took us to synagogue. You took us somewhere, that's for sure. <laughs> but as long I want to as thank I took you. Know, somewhere, brother. As long you as did. As I you, took, took you, somewhere. <laughs> you did. You took me somewhere. You took all of us somewhere. So that's going to wrap up the part one of this. But when we come back in part two, I want to talk to you. No, first, I want to say that I definitely understand. You know why um, my D asked you to be a part of 
our work at Soul Focus Group because everything you just said aligns so clearly and closely with what we're doing at Soul Focus Group. You know, the being 100% on our own side and knowing that we can create whatever world we want to create, both for ourselves and for everybody, right? So when we come back, I want to talk about whether or not you can have social consciousness in that corporate world. And uh, when I say corporate world, I include nonprofits in that, by the way, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But I really want to, to ask that question, and I want you to apply those uh, six principles uh, that you just shared with us. How do we apply that to long-term social change, long-term transformational change in this society with all of the the negativity and all the ills that we're dealing with right now. That's what I really want us to talk about when we come back. Are you good with that? I would love to do that. Yes, let's do it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, uh, with that, we're going to thank everybody for listening. As always, we appreciate you so much. We love you and we care about you and everything we talk about is so that you know we can all make better us's and a better world together. Uh, we ask that you check out all of our podcasts on whatever platform you listen to, whether it be Android or Apple. And look us up on YouTube. You can come to our website at soulfocusedgroup.com. That's soulfocused with an ED group.com. Again, uh, we're so glad that you listened to us. Uh, We want you to stay safe and stay well uh, with everything going on in this world right now. And most importantly, we want you to stay soul focused. If you wish to support and represent the Soul Focus Group, check out our apparel store at our website, www.soulfocusgroup.com forward slash shop.